Oh, best steak again? Best steak again. I mean, what else? I know. Who'd have thought it? Who would have thought what? Well, all that time ago, who'd have thought that we'd be doing well enough today to eat steaks? Or to be able to count the profits. Exactly. Do you remember the day things were so bad we began to think we might take a break from making clothes to sell in the market and turn to something else? Mm. They were hard times. There was no steak in those days. Best end of bone, if we were lucky. Mm. Uh, all right, dear. Off we go, then. Right. Oh, it's true. I remember it just like it was yesterday. I had a feeling it was a dreadful mistake to give up on the weaving business, even if it was only for a short time. Well, nobody was buying your shawls. Things looked black. It was either starve or change. So, we changed. Oh, it had been a dreadfully hard day in the woods that day, looking for mushrooms and plums. Well, that's why I gave you the mushrooms to pick. Mushrooms are lighter than plums. Yeah, but there were ten times more mushrooms than plums. <laughs> Odd that, wasn't it? Hmm, uneven, I'd call it. But what a time I had in the market that day. Who would have thought a few plums would cause all that trouble? Get your lovely plums. Here they are, they're lovely. Mmm. Oh, oh, well done. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Well done. Lovely. Oh, hey, hold on, hold on. How was I to know that everybody was sick and tired of the glut of apples and that mine were the only plums on the market? Ow! Ooh, Ooh. Get off him, you bully! It wasn't as though I was overcharging. Ow! Ow! Mine were exactly the same price as Mr and Mrs Farmer used to charge when they had lots of plums. Oh, oh. You could have heard a pin drop at my end of the stall. It was so quiet. Everybody seemed sick to death of mushrooms. You'd have thought they had a bad smell the way people kept away from them. I thought they were lovely mushrooms. Trouble was, they were just like everybody else's mushrooms. The shepherds, the masons, the cowards and the farmers. Particularly the farmers. Yeah, trust their luck to turn up with the year's first tomato crop when everybody's fed up to their teeth with mushrooms. Oh, dear. Oh, what a day. Oh, I know. <sighs> you know what? I wouldn't have cared if I'd never ever seen another plate of mushrooms. Oh, oh no. no. They were all rotten by the next day anyway, so we ended up throwing them all away. At least that was one advantage. No, disadvantage is what I called it. Something else could have been stored for a rainy day, but not mushrooms. No, not mushrooms. Oh. And then I suddenly had another thought. Why don't we use things the other way round? Why don't we only spend an hour or so collecting mushrooms and the rest of the time collecting masses and masses of plums? Ah. That please our customers. And make us a fortune. What a brilliant idea. It really made sense. Mushrooms were getting harder to find anyhow, and the plum crop was getting better and better. So that's exactly what we did. But it's funny how things don't turn out how you expect. <coughs> oh. <coughs> oh, there we are. I remember that day. Calling out, get your lovely juicy plums. Roll up then, roll up. Here they are now. Fruit to tingle your taste buds. Roll up and please, um, form an orderly queue. Roll up, roll up. Plums all fat and juicy. Everyone a winner. Come on, ten cents a bowl, all fresh picked with my own fair hands this morning. Straight from the... Hello. Oh. Uh, all right, one at, one at a time, please. Um, sorry, can you be, can you just be patient? Oh, it wasn't what I'd call one of the most successful of days. Even though it was a slack time, I'm sure we could have earned more money on either day by weaving cloth and selling clothes. Just as last time we had a load of mushrooms we didn't know what to do with, this time we had a mass of overripe plums. Too true. Rich man, poor man... Beggar man, 
bankrupt. You know, I remember thinking that. The first time, people would have paid three times as much for my plums. Yeah, and I remember thinking I'd have sold all my mushrooms if only I'd been charging half the price. Right. And at half the price, I'd have sold all my plums the next day. Mm, and the next day, I could have sold all my mushrooms at three times the price. <sighs> oh well, we said. That's life. And then we suddenly had a thought. Why should it be for life? We'd always done things in the same old way. But why should we always charge ten cents a bowl? That's true. We always had. Everybody always had. Why couldn't we change it? We couldn't. We could. There was no law against it. This is what we said to ourselves. Look, how much did we make on the first day? Well... Ten bowls of plums at ten cents, that's a hundred cents. Ten bowls of mushrooms, another hundred cents. So, two hundred cents altogether. And how much could we have got by adjusting the prices? Let's see, um, I could have got thirty cents a bowl. That's three hundred cents. Mm, and if only I'd cut the mushrooms down to five cents, I'd have sold the lot. And you had sixty bowls worth. That's right. Hey, that makes 300 cents. Right. Ah. So just by changing the prices, we could have made 600 cents instead of 200 cents. Yeah, and today we could have done just the same. We took 200 cents today, but we could have got 300 cents for 10 bowls of mushrooms at 30 cents and 300 cents for 60 bowls of plums at 5. Sense. So, we said to one another, why don't we try it? After all, we said, they can't kill us for trying. <laughs> <laughs> and so we did. Next time, we managed to find lots of ripe apples, but we also found the season's first peaches. So we charged 30 cents for the peaches and 5 cents for the apples. When they saw what we were doing, people were surprised. At first, they were a bit angry at the high prices of the peaches. So I told them they didn't have to buy if they didn't want to. But some people who'd had a very good week could afford it. Others wanted them so much they were prepared to do with less of something else. And between them they bought up all the peaches despite the price. There we go. They're lovely. And at my end of the stall, people were really pleased to find such good cheap apples. It's true, the farmers were selling nice apples too, but at ten cents a bowl. Five cents is a very different matter. They didn't buy all of them, mind, so I offered the last lot at two bowls for five cents. Two and a half cents a bowl is a bargain some people couldn't refuse. See? And there we were, at the end of the day. There'd been no fights or scrambles for peaches. No apples left to rot, and instead of the 200 cents we'd probably have made if we'd not adjusted the prices, we got nearly 600 cents to show for our troubles. It's an unavoidable fact of life that goods have to be allocated somehow, and we discovered for ourselves that the price of goods can prevent fights or long queues on the one hand, and huge surpluses on the other. Am I right or am I right? <laughs> And it all goes towards demonstrating a general principle that applies to marketing anywhere. It makes no difference whether it's fish, or furniture, kettles, or computers, boots, or books. Nothing has an absolute price or an absolute value. Take any commodity you care to mention, no matter how ordinary. Its value always depends on the circumstances. Take water, for example. In a country near the equator, it can be very expensive because it's difficult to come by. And in the middle of the desert, near an oil well, in a country like this, a barrel of water can cost more than a barrel of oil. This chap's selling water, and he's doing very well. But in these same places, dates can be so common, have so little value, that scarcely anybody bothers to pick them. On the other hand, there are some countries where dates are rare and expensive delicacies. Yet in these same places, water might cost next to nothing because it's so easy to come by. 
However, water is as essential to life here as it is anywhere on Earth. If you live on the edge of a lake, you might have thousands of times more than you need, so its price isn't high. Just because something is high in demand doesn't automatically mean it's expensive. The balancing point is price. It regulates on the one hand supply and on the other hand demand. The fascinating thing is that if you go to any market or any shop, every price you see on every single thing that's for sale has a story to tell. It tells you, for example, how plentiful or how scarce something is in relation to the number of people who are not only able to buy it, but are willing to buy it. Comparing prices can tell you a great deal about different things with similar characteristics. An avocado can weigh the same and may even have the same nutritional value as a potato, but the different price of each can tell you how much more difficult one was to produce than the other, or how far it had to travel and how much people want it. Changing prices makes another interesting story. The way the price of cherries and of salmon changes between early May and late June can tell you a great deal about when cherries grow best or about how easy it is to catch salmon or when the season is open or closed. But what price tells you about something has nothing to do with its absolute value. Price can only tell you about value relative to a particular place at a particular time. It's the relationship between supply and demand. It's like a pair of scales. The price pointer is in the middle. If demand is on the right and supply on the left. When demand is great and supply is small, the pointer will move to a higher price. But when supply increases and demand decreases, the pointer moves to a lower price. And this tells us the first simple but important law of demand. The higher the price, the smaller the quantity that will be demanded. Or, if you prefer, the lower the price, the greater the quantity that will be demanded. It's a law that applies to this and every other market you can think of.